We begin with the big issue, payrolls. Joining us now to discuss is Mohammed al Aaron of Queen's College, Cambridge, BlackRock's Rick Reader. Gentlemen, let's get straight to it. Mohammed, your take on the payrolls data from 31 minutes ago. So on a standalone, John, Goldilocks for markets and consistent with a soft landing for the economy. Um, job creation, yes, slightly less than expected, but nothing drastic, nothing suggesting a collapse in the, in the labor market. Unemployment rate, yes, higher, but very, very little. And 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 wage gr- growth slightly down in terms of um, what we've seen month on month and year on year. So if you take all that, it reinforces what has been a very dramatic week. Um, the only thing I did not like was labor force participation. That came down. And as Chair Powell said two days ago, and you saw the reaction of the market, the market just loved it because high force, high labor force participation is good for growth, for inflation, for stocks, for bonds. Um, we need to continue to enhance the supply side. And unfortunately, labor force participation came down. But I think on the whole, this is going to be welcomed both by markets and the economy. Well, you said the market loves it. Bond market loves it. We're down 12 basis points at the front end on a two-year, 487. Rick, on a 10-year, we're down 12 to 454. It's only a few Mondays ago. We had a five-handle on a 10-year. We're now back to about 450 on a 10-year. Rick, it's not amazing. It's not fantastic. It's not terrible either. It's not brutal. What is it? Uh, so, so I'd say a couple of things. I agree with everything Mohammed said around the uh, around the numbers. You know, the one thing, a couple of other points I would make relative to that. One is, you know, it's interesting. You know, we've talked about it on the show before. If you look at if you look at things like healthcare and education, another eighty nine thousand jobs positive is only one fifty total. You take that out and then take out leisure and hospitality, which have been strong. The cyclical components uh, continue to moderate down. I think that's a really big deal. Um, and then, you know, the other side of it is, you know, if you take all the economic data we've gotten, it's all indicative of an economy that's slowing moderately, very moderately, but slowing. But the labor data has been solid. I mean, look at the JOLTS report this week, claims is still solid. The ECI is still solid. Now you're starting to see there is a lag dynamic. Now you're starting to see that for the Fed, it's a really big deal. Now that you're starting to see labor be symmetric to what you're seeing in other parts of the, econo- of the economy and the economic data. You know, it's down big time, dollar weaker, euro stronger, 107. For those of you just joining us, going into the opening bell, about 20 seven minutes from now. Equities near session highs, positive a half of 1%. Let's get a Mike McKee view on things. Mike, you've had a third, fourth, fifth look at this. What stands out for you? Well, I pretty much agree with what Rick says. It looks like a general slowing, but it isn't a terrible report. Uh, you look at the number, 150,000 jobs created, and you have to remember that, uh, that 48,000 of uh, them uh, were, were not counted because of uh, strike activity. 33,000 of those in the auto workers. We'll talk about that in just a second. But you get 180,000 jobs in that case, which is what the <laughs> estimate was. Uh, net revisions for the last two months down 101,000. It doesn't really surprise people because the number was so big last month. Unemployment rate does tick up by a little bit. And here's an interesting thing. The SOM rule, you've got to go up a half a percent based on a three-month rolling average. We're up four-tenths now. Uh, are we getting to the point where you might see recession? Yeah, hard to say in this point. In this case. Average hourly earnings certainly cooperating down to a 4.1% annual rate, which is what the Fed wants to see. Now, let's talk about this strike activity. 48,100 people mm-hmm were uh, found off the job during the month of October, and 33,000 of those were auto workers. So what you get uh, when you look at this overall is 180,000 or 198,000 if you put all the strikers back in. And that would have been an interesting question for the markets. And uh, maybe you can ask Rick uh, and Mohammed, what would the markets have done if we'd gotten 180 or 198,000 for a headline? Auto manufacturing, as I mentioned, lost 33 3,000 jobs. Manufacturing in total lost 35,000. But take away the auto workers, and it's only a loss of 2,000 jobs. And in three of the last four months, manufacturing's lost 2,000 jobs. Construction, though, is up. Private sector jobs, only 99,000. That might be something to keep an eye on uh, as uh, we're looking for uh, slowing. And then, of course, uh, something people will debate is we lost 201,000 people from the labor force and 348,000 in terms of how 
household employment. Uh, that's very different than the 150 that the establishment survey found. So people may be debating that. But is this a bad report? Doesn't really look like it. It's uh, bad compared to last month. But overall, it just shows the economy slowing a little bit. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Mike McKee teed us up. Mohammed, let's go there. If we added back in the auto workers, would this conversation this morning be different at all? I don't think so, John. It would have been exactly the same um, because look at it over time. In fact, the expectation, the consensus number of 180 had that already adjusted. So I don't think we would be having a different conversation. I also don't think we'd be having a different conversation about policies. No, we would be having a different conversation about what's going to drive the bond market. Rick, do you agree? So I think so. I mean, I, I you know, but I generally agree. I, listen, I think the Fed's done. I mean, I, you know, I think that's it. I mean, we needed to see the pay, you know, everything else is moderating. And by the way, you look at the manufacturing data, it, including the earnings reports we got almost across the board. And then obviously you look at it to the extent that, which the Fed should look at the global conditions, Europe is really slowing. So I think you should assume at this point the Fed is done. By the way, month on month, we were looking at average early earnings and the aggregate hours, and so you had flat income growth. I mean, that's, you know, for the Fed, I think that's a big deal, that, that it corroborates inflation is coming down, not straight line. Payroll is starting, labor now is finally starting to come off a bit. So I think it's a big deal, and I, I think at this point that the Fed is gonna be on hold for a while, and it probably could take December out of your out of your calculation. Mohammed, you heard it, the Fed's done. Rick Reader, Andrew Honhor City, also, the Fed is done. Mohammed, what do you say? I agree with that. Not only do I think the Fed is done, I think the Fed should be done. Um, And I think those numbers are just confirmation as to why the Fed should be done. When you hear lines like this one, second paragraph, Mohammed, in the Fed statement, tighter financial and credit conditions for households and businesses are likely to weigh on economic activity, hiring and inflation. And then you look at the move we've had this week, 40 basis points lower on a 10-year Mohammed, do you think we're unwinding some of what the Fed stated just a couple of days ago to the extent that maybe they have to take some of it back? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, they're getting in, into these vicious cycles um, and they've got to be careful. I, you know, I often think the Fed doesn't understand enough how their words are heard and read. Um, but, John, th- there is a bigger point, And you've heard me. I've said consistently on your show starting over a year ago, there is no reason for the U.S. to fall into recession in 2023. I do worry, however, about 2024. I do worry about the cumulative effects of all these rate increases. Um, As Rick rightly said, you see weakness happening all over the place. And we hope it's a soft landing. But keep an eye on it. Certainly, the global environment is not going to help us. The global environment will be a headwind to the economy. So I worry that not only are we slowing and the Fed is done, I worry that the cumulative effects of everything that's been, that has <laughs> happened may push us down too far. I'm with you, Mohammed. It matters why the Fed's done. So, Rick, let's go there. You said the Fed is done. Let's throw in the data. We're seeing a slowdown in the economy. It's not a big call to make. We've just had close to 5% GDP growth in the third quarter. You're going to see that slow down, no doubt. Rick, is that sufficient reason to sit here and say, I want to buy risk, I want to buy stocks, I want to buy credit? So listen, I mean, this is a pretty unique point in time that the yield, you know, we've dropped, like you said, we've dropped, Treasury rates have dropped significantly. We've had some spread tightening. I still think these yield levels, particularly the front to the belly of the yield curve, you can clip, I mean, buying a quality fixed income portfolio, you can still clip. You know, we put together portfolios that are six and a half, seven. We have some that are that we feel really good about that are seven and a half yield without really dipping down the credit spectrum. That is pretty, I mean, that to me, into, if you go into 2024 and think about, gosh, I can build a lot of income. I don't have to do it by going down into low quality sovereign or, or, or corporate. That's pretty attractive. And then, listen, I think equities will do their job. I mean, listen, if if you don't go into a significantly deep recession, which I really don't think is going to happen, I still think there's there's almost seven trillion sitting in money market funds. As long as you believe we're not going to get bludgeoned, capital won't get bludgeoned by the the central bank continuing to raise rates. Yeah, I think it's a pretty good environment, both for equities and, for example, listen, our equities going to have this sort of 
uh, incredible performance they had, particularly the big tech seven, magnificent seven. No, I don't think so. But the um, but I think you can still have pretty good return in uh, in some of these risk assets and the yielding assets. You know, you, you, if the Fed's not going to raise rates, your carry that you have in some of these income producing assets in high quality are, are pretty darn attractive. And you saw, by the way, the last few days you've seen some pretty good pretty good buying of those. Mohammed, we talked about this bond market losing its anchors. The ECB, the BOJ, developments in China, the Federal Reserve. All it's taken is a 30 basis point move this week on a 10 year treasury. And you get the feeling that people are starting to sense that maybe the old world is just around a corner. Have we fully internalized, Mohammed, this new regime? Um, John, we have to understand that we are in transition. For two years now, the bond market, in, in my opinion, has been influenced mainly by central bank policy. Whether it's 2022, the, the Fed and others having to catch up on inflation and, and hiking rates very aggressively, or this year when markets had to recognize that rates were going to stay higher for longer. I think the Fed actually and other central banks are going to be less of an influence. And when we look to next year, we're going to be talking about who's buying U.S. Treasuries. We're going to be spending a lot of time looking at auctions. Um, it's going to be a different narrative. I must tell you, this is a really hard market also to figure out the technicals. For example, and Rick is better placed. If you're an investor in high yield, in 48 hours, you've seen 60 to 70 basis points of carry disappear from whatever you were going to buy. Forget about a week. In 48 hours, John, we have seen a massive spread compression, and we've seen in addition what's happening to Treasury. So when the yields move this, this much, it's not clear to me whether you attract more buyers or whether people stay on the sideline just wanting this volatility to go down. And, and there's no one better than Rick to give us a sense for how the technicals are going to play out. And Rick, the floor is yours. So can I just go ahead with what Mama said? Next week, we're going to get Treasury supply of $500 billion. <laughs> Next week, we're going to get, I mean, I just reiterate, that's, by the way, that's 40, gross supply. That's 40% higher this week. Is 40 percent higher than this week last year. The number's staggering. The amount of bills we're going to we're going to get Treasury refunding next week. Let's take the other side of it. The technicals. The uh, in the uh, in the high yield market. The, whole, the high yield market's a trillion and a half dollar market. But we're getting 500 billion of Treasuries next week. The whole high yield market's a trillion and a half. And the uh, and the, the issuance level is light to say the least. I've never seen a more technically driven market. By the way, the equity market, part of why the technicals there are so well supported. This year, I think it's 800 billion of authorized buyback. There's 19 billion of IPOs. So you have buying, no selling, and the Treasury is issuing immense amounts of debt. So, I mean, in my career, I don't recall a more technically driven market than we're seeing today. And it's part of why some of these markets, single names are so shallow. Uh, the depth of these markets is atrocious. It's because it's an incredibly technical market in, in, in almost all forms today. Rick, when you say the depth of this market is atrocious, are you also talking about the treasury market? And how much of a change is that? <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, the depth of the treasury market generally is pretty good. It moves around with, and, and uh, I think Bauman said it, the auctions that we're going to get, we're just going to be continued focus on can we keep pumping this much debt into the system on the, on the risk-free rate, and that will be how you interpolate every other asset classes. That's a, that's a tremendous amount. The depth, generally, the treasury market's pretty good. It's not as good as it normally is because people are uncertain about whether it's geopolitics, whether it's these big rate moves. The depth of single-name equities, the depth of some of the some of the risk markets generally are, uh, are pretty thin. And, you know, a lot of that is geopolitical risk that people don't want to get in the way of it. And a lot of it is just people sitting on their hands for a while. You know, he, by the way, here to four, sitting in, sitting in money market funds and clipping five plus percent or bills and getting 560 has been an attractive way to play it. So that's why, part of why you've got shallow depth in a lot of other markets. Rick, do you need to see stability in treasuries before you see stability elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, so... Listen, I think that, well, I think the first thing is the Fed, you know, the, the concept of now that the Fed has data that is consistent inflation, employment that shows this moderation, that's a big deal. So you don't have the central bank that is twisting around in terms of, in terms of the thought process. So I think that's a big deal. And then the other is, like you say, is can we keep digesting this much supply of treasuries? Listen, as long as the backdrop is pretty good around the data and the Fed, I think you'll start to see people push out of money market funds. We saw it, as Mike Mohammed said, you saw it in the last three or four days. And my sense is that will be durable. Is it, like I say, it's a question, 
listen, at some point, we're going to have to deal with how much treasury, how much government debt there is. And that is, that to me is still a big governor on, uh, on the risk markets for a while. Well, Hamid, just a final word. I sense from you, you're not anticipating that stability anytime soon going into 2024. I'm hoping for it, John. I'm really hoping for it. Um, we've got to recognize that U.S. Treasuries are the benchmark, not only internally, but internationally. And this crazy volatility, I mean, seriously, crazy, crazy volatility means you complicate financial intermediation, you lower the standing of the U.S. globally, and you risk breaking something. So I'm really hoping for greater stability. Um, now it's not going to be just the Fed. And Fed communication has got to improve. It really has got to improve. There's been now several studies showing that part of the volatility we've had is associated with the way things are said by Fed officials. Um, let's hope that we do get it because it's central to so many things, as Rick rightly says. Well, they're getting plenty of practice, Mohammed. A lot of opportunities to talk again. Mohammed, thank you. Mohammed Alerian, Rick Reed, a two of the very best every Payrolls Friday. Always enjoy your contributions, gents. Thank you.